Meanwhile, with Cam Newton sidelined for last night's Panthers Bucks game because of a concussion, multiple people in his inner circle have counseled him to play more carefully. Sources telling ESPN those close to Newton have urged him to get down, out of bounds, or into the end zone quicker than he did in week four when he allowed the Falcons a free shot at him as he reached for the end zone. Cam has reportedly acknowledged the message and said he will do a better job of protecting himself when he can. The Panthers are now one and four on the season, putting them last in the NFC South. Jeff, I want to start with you here. How much of their poor start in terms of responsibility should be on Cam's shoulders? Well, there's 52 other guys who haven't pulled their weight either. So to just single out Cam and say he is fully responsible or more responsible, um, I, I wouldn't go there. The one area I would say he is responsible uh, to a degree was the play in Atlanta when he coasted in the end zone and, get, and, and basically gave them a shot to take you out. And, and when you're talking about your franchise, right, the league MVP, struggling team, right, you're down, you got, you got the Falcons at home, division opponent, all those things, you got to protect yourself. As a quarterback and as the franchise, all the things that you can do for this football team, it's important that you protect yourself. So now what you've done by taking that shot is you've given you the next opponent, which is the Bucks, and, an, and a quarter with the Falcons, or two quarters with the Falcons, how many played, a chance to jump you in the division. So there is some responsibility for what he did. But let's get before that. He has taken an immense amount of hits from the offensive line, from protection blunders, from guys missing, from missing hot reads, whatever it is. But when I tell you, and, and I've been beating this drum for a while, he takes incredibly violent hits. It's not just sacks, somebody tackling and rolling him, doing those things. He is getting smoked. I mean, guys are running through him, and it can be two and three guys at a time. He's getting driven into the ground. That takes a toll no matter who you are. I understand he's a big man, he's physical, he's all those things. But take it back to Denver in week one. He's taking these shots, and you can tell standing up, he's a different guy. Now, concussion, protocol, all that, I have no idea. I don't, I'm not getting that word. But I'm telling you, he's taking hits that will make playing the game more difficult. No different in Minnesota, right? Same type mentality. These guys are pinning their ears back. They know the line can't protect. And he's taking these shots where he's not protecting himself or he's not getting down to live to play the next day. So there is a small amount of responsibility in that. From my perspective, if I'm him and I know, I, mean, I remember Peyton Manning used to say it all the time, hey, I'm going to live to play the next day. Free runner, I'm getting down. Now, is it the most heroic thing in the world? <laughs> no. But did he play for an awfully long time at an awfully high level? Absolutely. And did he give us chances to win much further down in his career and, and bigger games? You live to play those plays. And I think that's good advice. And for Cam, he is competitive. I love the way he plays the games. There is no player in the NFL that can take this kind of beating and sustain it and continue to be productive for, you know, for many more years. He's got to protect himself at some point to be the type of player, the MVP caliber yep. he can be. Jeff, Saturday, I'm disappointed in your position. And the reason why I say I'm disappointed in your position, even though, because even though you pointed out that he's a small part, you primarily stayed focused on him. The Carolina Panthers this year, Still over the first five weeks, one of the better offenses in the game. Eighth in yards per play, third in yards per game, 11th in points per game. The bottom line is that Dave Gettleman is the biggest reason why the Carolina Panthers are struggling right now because he didn't ensure that either he kept Josh Norman or that he replaced him with McLean or Worley. You know, one guy that was, st that was sticking Julio Jones a couple of games ago when he gave up 12 receptions for 300 yards, turned around, and what happened? He's not even under the, on the roster now. This defense is a shell of itself. Kawan Short hasn't showed up and produced to the level that he was producing last year, albeit there are reasons for that, but he still isn't the same impactful player. Luke Keekley can only do but so much. He doesn't have help because he's got to help on the backside and he's got to help on the front side as well. And because Josh Norman isn't there, you've got huge, huge holes in your secondary. Does Cam Newton deserve a small bit of blame for what has transpired? You're absolutely right about that because you've got to make yourself available. You can't put yourself in precarious situations that's going to get you concussed and knocked out and held out of games because if he's playing last night, chances are he doesn't throw two of the three interceptions that Derek Anderson through, particularly one in the end zone that ultimately could have given them the lead and they would have ended up winning the game. But the at the same time, 
Cam Newton is not even close to being the big problem for the Carolina Panthers. It is their defense, which is a shell of itself right now because their secondary is such a question mark that it's put immense pressure on the front set on the front seven. It's compromised Keekley, It's compromised Thomas. It's compromised Kawan Short and the rest of the crew on that defensive line of scrimmage with Coney Ely and those boys. It's compromised everybody. That is the problem with the Carolina Panthers, and that directly speaks to the general manager who decided to offer Josh Norman a, a contract and then renege on it and pull it off the table because he thought the locker room and all of this <laughs> other stuff would be better without the guy. Josh Norman's absence is the biggest reason the Carolina Panthers are struggling the way that they've been struggling right now this season because their defense is not the same. Yeah, here's the thing. I would agree with you on defensively, and, and they got run right at it last night, right up the middle, 25 of their 30 runs up the middle, so they're definitely not producing. But your numbers on the offense, when you watch the games, it ain't, it, it ain't about moving the ball. It's about putting that thing in and taking control of games. So regardless of where they stack up from, from, a, from a statistical perspective, you and I both know they aren't. Listen, at first and first and goal last night, why are you putting the ball in Anderson's hand to throw that thing. That ball should be run three times, right? Like that, that would have been run by Cam if he was in the game. Well, yeah, zone, zone read. Even if it's Anderson, run the play, man. Tolbert's still there. Payne, give them the ball. But but their identity is different when Cam is not yeah. on the field. It's a different identity. Whether whether whatever the numbers are, they aren't commanding the same respect offensively as they did last year the, either. The question is, how responsible is Cam for the hits he's taking? And I, and, I, and I get it why both of you mentioned first, look, there are a lot of problems on the Panthers. Cam isn't one of them. I, I agree. We, I think even, at, <clears throat> even before we just answer a straightforward question like how much of the responsibility does he get for taking the hits, we have to say they got problems. Absolutely. Cam Newton's not part of the problem. He's part of the solution. For sure. <clears throat> it's a lot of other guys <clears throat> who deserve blame for the problems. However, in terms of the hits he's taking, Partly it's the refs who allowed him to get hit the way they once allowed Shaq to get fouled on every play. Mm. Because they look at him, I think, and go, this dude is so big and strong. And then also he's out of the pocket a lot. That it's like in order to contend with him, you kind of got to right. let the other guys get away with something. I disagree with that in a full contact sport like football. It, it's, it's even more unfair in a, in a sport like football than it was for Shaq in basketball. Part of it is um, he's just taking hits, especially this year. He's faced some really good defenses, the Broncos and the Vikings. Ooh. And then he did that stupid thing against Atlanta, which is not a very good defense, but took a savage shot as though he was playing a good defense. He didn't make it any easier on, his, on himself. Right. Part of it is he's holding the ball too long in the pocket because his receiver, are not running the crispest routes I've ever seen and are therefore not always open. Um, so, you know, it's partly that. If you look at how much, like, you think of a guy like Roethlisberger, because not long ago he was the poster child right. for a big, strong quarterback who the refs might let you get away with a little something against because yeah. what are you supposed to do? That's right, maybe draped on. Cam, in the same number of years that he's been in the league with Roethlisberger, has been hit, listen to this, 500 more times Oof. than Roethlisberger. So, so a, a lot of other people deserve blame for it, no doubt. But part of it also has to be Cam Newton. He's got to slide. He's got to play a little smarter. Even when they use him as the de facto running back, he's got to be smarter about the way he does it. He can't hold that's the ball fine. as long hold in the on. pocket. I mean, you know, part of it's him. That, that, that's, fi that, that's fine. But when you're trying to overcompensate because you know the kind of team you played on last year and that it's a shell of itself defensively this go round, which puts more pressure on the offense. You're going to take chances. Of course, he has to do a better job of protecting himself. But again, it points to ultimate culpability being on a part of the defense, which is by the GM and his negligence of duty and doing what he was supposed to do because it puts more pressure on Cam to try and overcompensate and make up for what he knows this defense is lacking compared to what they did during their Super Bowl run. That's why I said the defense. Team's also missing uh, Jonathan Stewart as well. And mm -hmm. Cam, stay off the segways. We don't need to see you getting hit by pass <laughs> rushers, hit by cars. Oh, but we have to go to break. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for being Appreciate with us. It. Appreciate you. Time. After letting Brock Osweiler ditch Denver for Houston in free agency, John Elway and the Broncos had some big question marks at the quarterback position. The team decided to go with first-year starter Trevor Simeon, who managed to lead the team to a 4-0 record before leaving the game with a shoulder injury in Week Four against the Bucks. Simeon couldn't go this past week. 
and leading to rookie Paxton Lynch stepping in against the Falcons, who beat Denver 23-16. to Will Kane is back. How are we doing? I'm good. I want to start with you on this subject. Has Elway botched the quarterback situation in Denver? Well, I don't know if he's botched it yet, Molly, but the only thing saving him is three good games by a seventh-round draft pick. I mean, we all are living under this delusion right now that John Elway is a football genius who's reinvented football, where all you need is a middle-of-the-road, middle-class, workmanlike quarterback and an amazing defense, and you win Super Bowls. And we're overlooking the fact John Elway is doing everything he can not to be in that situation. Max, look at this. I'm just going to give you the history over the last two years of John Elway. Number one, he signed Peyton Manning. Now, when he signed Peyton Manning, are we supposed to pretend like he thought he was just getting a quarterback on his last legs that was going to limp across the finish line and take a Super Bowl with him? No. No, he was signing Peyton Manning. And then after Peyton Manning, he tried to keep Brock Osweiler. Molly, in your introduction, with all due respect, you said, let Brock Osweiler go. That's not what happened. Brock Osweiler got a better offer from Houston that he never let Denver match. Denver offered 16 million a year, offered 30 guaranteed. They never went back to Elway and let him try to match it. So we don't know what Denver would have done. Then the answer was trade for Mark Sanchez. Then it was draft Paxton Lynch. He passed on Dak Prescott. Now listen, a lot of guys, including every guy in the league, passed on Dak Prescott three times. But again, Elway is doing everything he can to find a quarterback. It isn't some master plan that apparently was put, place in, put in place in April to, to have some team built around defense and a below average to average quarterback. That just wasn't the plan. And the only reason he's not getting called out for it right now is because a seventh round pick in Trevor Simeon has put three good games together. And once that guy wasn't around, you saw what happened this weekend. But making the pick case for Elway. You're How making that the case, case for the genius of John Elway, in fact. What is the genius? Because he doesn't have a crystal ball. There's no way to know with certainty what's going to happen. However, he GM'd the team to the Super Bowl be, uh, behind an outstanding offense led by a superb quarterback, maybe having the greatest season anyone's ever seen. And a couple years later, gets back and wins the Super Bowl based on subpar quarterback play, but an amazing defense. He reinvented it. Now, what he did here with the quarterback situation is he said it in the press. He said, look, I think there should be a middle class of quarterbacks. There are scrubs and there are franchise quarterbacks. I'm paraphrasing now. But there should be a middle class of quarterback, and I'd like to pay Brock Osweiler in that range, which is the right way a GM has to, to operate in a hard cap league. The whole value of a GM primarily, primary, primary value, is correctly pricing talent. You have to get that right in the draft, free agency, contracts to your own players. And he looked at Osweiler and said, I just can't pay him that much money. I he can't do it not do because that. he's not worth it. Well, the reason Osweiler left is because he, they had every indication they were going to pay him as a middle-class guy, not a franchise guy. So he was willing to take that risk. Yes, he was risking the fortunes of the team if he got really subpar quarterback play. But he looked around and said, you know what, we had subpar quarterback play last year. And I think we're, it's, a, it's a calculated risk worth taking that I can find a good enough quarterback or, you know, to take over right now. And the fact is, he did it. So reinventing as he goes, innovating, which you like, uh, it seems to me that you're making the case for Elway's value. I don't have the energy today to educate Will Kane as much as he desperately needs to be educated. What I will say to you is this. Two of the last three Super Bowls the Denver Broncos have played in. Um, they're, super, they're the reigning defending Super Bowl champions. Trevor Simeon, those three games that you point to that he played well, the man was drafted seventh round in 2015, didn't throw a single pass in his first professional football, football season. He comes out this year. He wins three games for them. The lone loss that they have is because they had a rookie in Paxton Lynch at quarterback last seen throwing for the University of Memphis. You got Emmanuel Sanders and Demarius Thomas as your wide receiver. You retained C.J. Anderson. Your offensive line is not shabby. Your defense is, is, is arguably the best in all of football. And the corners that you have with Roby, with Aqib Tlaib, with Chris Harris Jr. is clearly the best trio secondary in all of the NFL. I am quite sure that Will Kane and everybody else can pick apart and nitpick something here or there. The quarterback about John position. Elway. The court. Uh, this is not an indictment of John Elway as a GM in general. It's his management okay. of the quarterback position. Well, you have, well, wait a minute. You two see a master plan that involved Trevor Simeon, a seventh-round draft pick, rising to middle-class status. 
I see a reaction to continue no. striking out on finding someone hold on, else. Hold on, Max. And what I'm telling but you is, I can read between the lines. If you think they're going to win a Super Bowl with Trevor Simeon, maybe. Max likes historical, historical precedent. I'm just telling you, it's such a rare historical precedent for a first year starter to win a Super Bowl. That John Elway might pull it off. He might. But, but you know what? Well, well, you well, can run on. through a dynamite factory with a lit match. You might make it out alive. But wait, but wait a minute. You have to hold on, hold on, Will. You have to make up your mind what you want to do week to week in terms of dollars and cents and how it might impact the decisions a particular GM makes. If you have a Demarius Thomas and an Emmanuel Sanders and a CJ Anderson who you retained so you can prevent him from going to Miami, and you've retained guys while losing a Danny Trevathan, while losing a Malik Jackson. So you sit up there and you say, okay, the quarterback is worth this much. This is what we believe he brings to the table. Even though it would have been ideal to keep Brock Osweiler because he's somebody we nurtured and we wanted him to be that guy. The, if he leaves, the backup plan that we have in place allows us to continue moving forward with the vision we had, which is consistent with what we wanted. So really, the only thing to hold against John Elway is if you're telling me under no circumstances should he have lost Brock Osweiler. And I'm not sure how people in yeah, Houston I, would feel about you saying that. Yeah, right I don't now. know. I'm not. I think it's a straw man argument that he had a master plan. I think, you know, the definition of a dilemma is, is actually a choice between two bad options. It's not just a hard decision. John Elway had a dilemma. There were no great quarterbacks to be had once Peyton Manning declined. RG3, already hurt. Kaepernick, not ready to play, obviously. Sam Bradford, not considered a great quarterback. And they got a king's ransom for him. Osweiler, do you think Osweiler's necessarily better than just, Simeon? Just, These were his options. Just to be clear, those he took weren't calculated his options. Risks. Max, we have seen Sam Bradford play wonderfully for the Minnesota Vikings. That was an option for John Elway. We have seen Dak Prescott perform wonderfully. That was an option for John Elway. That, the question is argument. this. No, it's not. Yeah, you're if saying John Elway managed the quarterback position to put himself in position to maximize his Super Bowl abilities? Right. And the answer is no. no, no you're saying and the only reason we're not having this conversation more readily is because you've seen three games from Trevor Simeon. I'm that, telling that's, you, that's, that's a, a good, shaky wait, wait. ground to be on. Absolutely. In other words, the argument hasn't been decided whether or not the calculus risk he took paid off this year, although in the long run not being tied to Osweiler for big money, I think is probably a pretty good bet. But when you argue, well, Dak Prescott was available, everyone passed on him a couple times at least, uh, but he was available. That's or, less or of a Bradford is playing really well and still healthy. Let's see if that continues. All you're really saying is that Elway, in your opinion, hasn't necessarily been proven to have made the optimal choice at quarterback yet of every, op I of every position. However, for a guy playing on the, you know, on the fly here, trying to make do with the best situation and not handcuff his franchise with a bad contract, I'd say so far the evidence looks pretty good, wouldn't you? I'd say right now, for example, when I came on your show and said they should do everything they can to trade for Philip Rivers, and you both said that's insane, I said, well, at least Stephen A said it was okay. insane. All right, fine. I, I, I was met with this reaction. There is a master plan in Denver, and what I see is not a master plan. I see continuous reaction to bad circumstances. Maybe, Max, you're right. He's making the best of bad circumstances. But I see a few other examples he could have taken. Bradford. Prescott, whatever it may be. Let's see how it shakes out. You're also assuming Simeon is not better than Osweiler. We for have a to lot go, less Max. Money. Guys, yeah, we gotta go <laughs> to I got to go. I got to go to commercial now. You know it's bad. You pull but I got to tell you we got to go to commercial. All right, all right. So if you haven't gotten enough of Stephen A. in today's first take, didn't get your fix, you can watch him on radio, one to three, or listen to him, excuse me, Sirius XM Mad Dog. And then if that's not enough, tonight, Stephen A. late night seems a perfect uh, match made in heaven there. He will be on Jimmy Kimmel Live tonight. We'll give you a preview when we come back. Oh, really?